The following is a presentation of the Chicago Bears Network and ChicagoBears.com. Download the Chicago Bears official mobile app for up-to-the-minute Bears content every day. And now, welcome to Bears All Access, your all-access pass into Chicago Bears football. Bears All Access is brought to you by IGS Energy and sponsored by Athletical Physical Therapy and CDW. Friday night, everybody. Welcome into Bears Hall Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Good to have you alongside with my broadcast partner from News Radio 780, Tom Thayer. And coming up in our next segment or two, we'll hear from Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL Radio, the former Chicago Bears quarterback. And at the bottom of the hour, we're going to be joined by Roquan Smith, the Ed Black Courage Award winner, represented the Bears here for 2020, an outstanding 2020 season. Looking forward to his return in 21 and be looking forward to that conversation. Good evening, Tom. Rough day, though. Rough day for all Bears fans, the Bears family in general, with uh, news about Steve Mongo McMichael, uh, a diagnosis of ALS, and you have been aware of this and have been visiting him and know intimately what the man's going through. But first and foremost, prayers to his family, his wife Mindy, his daughter, and uh, everybody in that uh, – that circle because uh, this is a unique individual and yes his football playing excellence is something you often just go right to when you talk about it but he is much more than just a football player and a great friend and a great guy he is um i love steve mcmichael and i always have and i love him as a teammate and i appreciate him as a friend what he did for me as when i came to the bears as a young man and we're so aware of the persona of the Bears defense. I knew what Hamp was all about. I know what Mongo is all about. I had four warnings of guys I was playing with in the USFL, how good these guys are and how hard they practice. Even the day I walked into Steve McMichael when I was became aware that he was diagnosed with ALS, I still see the Steve McMichael that I know at the fir- from the first time we ever met. That's the Steve McMichael that's in my mind. The Steve McMichael that I see nowadays, the disease has accelerated, and he is he is a different he is a um, a different shell of himself that he was when I when I got to know him. However, my appreciation for him is not has not extinguished at all. Um, I love his knowledge. I love his, the opportunity, the ability to talk to him. Um, when I hug him goodbye. It means a lot to me because I appreciate him so much. His wife, Misty, and his daughter, Macy, are a great support system for him. It, where he lives inside that house, you get to go in there and you try to share a lot of memories and a lot of good time conversation of what we all used to be. Because believe me, I'm a lot different than what I used to be as a 23-year-old man, a 23-year-old young guy meeting Steve McMichael. But the memories we talk about, the instances that we've lived through, good and bad in terms of a football life, there's still there's such immediate recall. So I think when the general public became aware of what Steve McMichael is fighting through right now, I, I do. I, there's sympathy for him. People that know appreciate the opportunity of being. You understand what he was at the height of Atlanta. That's the, again, that's still what I see. That's what I believe in, and that's the Steve McMichael that I know and I'll always remember. Yeah, Dan Wiederer, the Chicago Tribune, did an outstanding uh, job and a very difficult story to write. Uh, that Steve trusted in him, also to uh, Jared Payton. Uh, obvious connections uh, with Walter and the fight that he had, that Matt Suey was side-by-side side with him and importance to that family. He, he basically, uh, Jared called him his football-playing uncle, is, is Steve McMichael, who was his coach for the Chicago team that he played for his last assignment, I think, back in 2010. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's family. And the Bears organization also stepping up, the McCaskey family, if I'm not mistaken, purchasing or helped fund the uh, – the wheelchair, which is hard to say without tearing up and getting emotional about, just to think of that man uh, and his persona, like you mentioned, his personality, the energy which he brought with him when he came into a room. He told it like it is and still does. Uh, he still does every single minute of his life. He puts things in perspective from his unique point of view. And uh, I, I laugh and, and want to cry, too, at the same time because – 
you know, he'd sit there and tell you, he'd go through life's uh, challenges with you, not just football, and he just put things in his unique way and focus, and you learn something from him every time. And, you know, long ago when you started teaching me what football is all about, once you got to the inside out of what this game is and breaking down tape and everything about how significant intelligence is, not just in the trenches uh, at every position, but Steve McMichael was one smart football player. He was, and he hid behind it sometimes because he had that Mongo persona that was that big, rough, tough Texas guy in which he was. However, he was super intelligent. If you would try to play him for something or try to get something out of him, he could see right through you. And that's what I loved about Steve McMichael is it's, it's his effort, his hard work, his dedication to every one of his teammates, his dedication to Mike Ditka, to the McCaskies and the Chicago Bears throughout his entire career. Um, I remember going to a Chicago slaughter game when he was the head coach of that indoor team. And I saw the way these kids gravitated towards him. They wanted to hear what Steve had to say. They wanted to um, watch his his appearance on the sideline and the way he treated them and the way he treated them when they came off the field. It was kind of like when I became a teammate of Ming. Um, he, He was such a gracious guy and such a an interesting guy to get to learn from because he was teaching me about offensive line play as a defensive lineman. It was never too big for him. He never he always had time for those types of those reps, the the tools that he took and he made you feel that the competition you were playing against on Sunday was not as good as the competition that I was facing throughout the week in a practice every day against him. And um you know, being there last week when you see the wheelchair and then you see the van they got that has a wheelchair accessibility for him so he can get out. He's, you know, he can, uh, Misty can drive him around and get to the different appointments and stuff he needs to be at. But um, uh, it's just the hardest thing when you go see Steve is when you hug him at the end of the time spent with him. Because you're not being embraced by a 275-pound Hercules of a man. He can't raise his arms anymore. So he puts his head on your shoulders, and that's as meaningful as anything you can go through. Oh, gosh. Yep. Well, I tell you what, it's quite the family you 85 Bears had together, and a lot of you guys are stepping up, guys like Dan Hampton and Otis Wilson and Gary Fensick, Dennis McKinnon. Otis, uh, Jay Hilgenberg, I'm sure many others are going to um, make that journey and uh, be there for Steve and, and the Bears organization. There is a GoFundMe page. Check that out as well as uh, his supporters are, have uh, put that together because it's a costly, costly uh, journey they're about to, to uh, embark on and have been embarking on. Okay, we pray for Steve and his family, that's for sure. We'll move on, take a break, and we'll be joined by Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL Radio. Get his thoughts on what is a... Less than a week away from the first round of the NFL draft, we'll break down some ideas, what he's been hearing. I, I have a feeling it's going to be a roller coaster ride of a draft. It's all just ahead, along with Roquan Smith at 6.30 here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Choose clean energy for your home at IGS.com because every good choice adds up to a better world. With a broadcast partner from News Radio 780 105.9 FM, WBBM, Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. We welcome in our special guest each week at this time, Big Jim Miller, quarterback, Chicago Bears 2001, and Sirius XM NFL radio host. I'm moving the chains with Pat Kerwin. Good evening, Jim. How are you doing? And what's the latest word you're hearing? as it relates to the Chicago Bears for this week's NFL Draft coming yeah, up. Yeah, good to be with you guys. Yeah, pretty exciting. Obviously, the the big trade today with Orlando Brown going to uh, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, Baltimore picking up uh, another first-round pick, and we'll have other compensation in it. But I think that's an indicator, too, when they we pick up uh, you know who they're going to play at left tackle. There could be a run on tackles, I think, in the first round. I think uh, because it is a, a deep draft with tackles, but – they're all different kinds. You got run blockers and uh, uh, at certain spots, two right tackles that I think are really good. That could be right there where where the Bears are selecting with their their first pick. Plus, you got to think if any of those quarterbacks fall through, 
Would that entice the Bears to to trade up if they do like who who slips through and it's somebody that maybe they could target from that standpoint? I still think the, there's some really good corners that'll be there as well. There's a lot of fighting right now. Who is truly the best corner? As you got Caleb Farley with the back injury out of out of Virginia Tech. Supposedly his medical went well. You you heard Dallas actually released all that tape on J.C. Horn. Saying, hey, the Dallas asked him in a basically a Zoom call, hey, uh, uh, JC, who do you think is the better? And he said, hey, no disrespect to uh, Patrick Sertan, but I'm truly the the best corner in this draft. And then Cal Pitts, the Florida tight end, he chimes in and agrees with <laughs> JC Horn. So who knows? Maybe Patrick Sertan uh, could fall uh, hopefully to the Bears. But I think a couple of tackles will be there. Tevin Jenkins, obviously out of. Uh, for him, for out of Oklahoma State, that is a big, burly uh, right tackle that I think everybody thinks is a plug-and-play player. And with Massey moving on now, maybe that's a position that the Bears were targeting. And that guy definitely would be available where they are at twenty, just sitting where they are. You know, when you look at you think about the Bears' offensive line, and you think about what the position they want to get themselves in the draft. I think they have a guy like Jermaine Fetty, who has played a lot of snaps throughout the entirety of his career. Now. If you're going to draft a tackle and he has starting potential, now what are you going to do with Jermaine Effetti? Are you going to put him into an already clogged middle of the Bears' offensive line and try to fit him into a position that you already have players for there? So I think the Bears, I mean, they really have to have a variety of selections that they have in mind just in case that plug-and-play tackle is not there. And even if he is, again, you're going to have to shift around, guys. Maybe there's some movable pieces on the day of the draft if they've shown enough to other teams that they can get in there and and complement their lineup. So, man, I I think it's probably one of the most confusing drafts um, after five because – there's a lot of teams that are in desperate need. There's teams that are at the bottom of the first round that desperately need quarterbacks. So I think the maneuvering on the on the first day of the draft and the second day of the draft, for that matter, is that there's going to be a lot of movement, a lot of phones ringing, and a lot of guys that better be a paying attention to their telephones well who, who knows they may attack the offensive line a couple of times I just I like Jermaine Effetti more as a right guard and just guys that I've talked to around the league they feel the same way when he was in Seattle that was somewhat of a struggle for him and he had the penalty issues and they just they believe he plays better at the right guard spot than the right tackle and so we'll, we'll see what the Bears do certainly he's had the ability to, to do both and that's uh, that's good for him. You like to have that versatility as, as you can back up, Tom. That's always nice to have on your offensive line. But I'm thinking a, a big right tackle potentially could be in the wheelhouse for the Bears. That's if it's not in the first round, at some point in this draft. Say you got you know the Jalen Marshall kid from from Michigan. He may be there uh, as the draft rolls along. He could slip out of the first round. I think many have him going uh, in the second round, in the middle part of it, and we'll we'll see what happens there. But there there is tackles of all kinds. That, that could be had in this draft. I think the most challenging aspect of it from the scouts uh, that I've spoken to and other uh, people that have uh, been in this business a long time is that, and this was posted today too by Lewis Riddick uh, of ESPN, that there's so much missing info on these guys, yeah. especially the medical, because, what, 150 guys went to Indianapolis. Some of those are rechecks, some just because they needed to get measured and stuff. I mean, it's a a very risky thing when you're talking about draft assets and how much pressure there is on guys to make the right choices without getting face-to-face with guys, and it's just different. And I know everybody's on the same path as this, but the medical information, uh, that's absolutely necessary. And to really look in a guy's eyes and see, you know, what's he really all about? I think it's going to be – that's why I think there's going to be a lot of trades – going to be a lot of trades out of this draft into 2022 because they hope to be back to normal and have a normal process and I think that could impact every team in the league including the Bears well what what about the receiver from Alabama that weighed in at 166 pounds now is that like almost a medical concern because you know how physical the game is of football is here's a guy that's healthy but because he's 166 pounds you know, there's question marks about what he can really contribute to your team. Listen, what I've seen out of college, this dude can play football. Yeah, I think he and can he play. And he can play, and he keeps his body safe. But 
that's all I hear all week is 166 pound weigh in. What you know? What does that mean for his future in the way he's looked at by some of the scouts in the NFL? Jim can help yeah. answer that one. Yeah, well, I think for for him, when you look at Devontae Smith, one he won the Heisman, like you said, he he was their kick returner and punt returner as well. So Nick Saban felt comfortable. You know, that's you got to be a pretty tough player to to be a return man. I think we all agree with that. And I think a lot of people, when you look at his speed. I think his comparable is somebody like Deshaun Jackson when Philadelphia drafted uh, D-Jack so high, right? He, everybody's like, oh, look at how wire he is. But the biggest problems with the, with Deshaun Jackson was that guy's so fast he lives in the future. He always had all the hamstring issues, <laughs> um, you know, and things like that. And and obviously he's, he's had some issues from that standpoint. But he's a tremendous football player. I, I, don't, I don't, you know, he's not the top receiver. I think we know Jamar Chase is, everybody says, is the unanimous uh, best receiver, you know, since probably Calvin Johnson uh, came out. He is that special of, of a player. Then you've got the other guys. His teammate Waddle will probably get selected before Devontae Smith, but I think he's he's not creeping out of the first round. And there, there are so many good receivers in this draft. Rashad Bateman, Elijah Moore from Ole Miss. I mean, it goes on and on. All types, X's, Z's, slots. I mean, it's it's easily double digits that you'll have a plethora of receivers to choose from as the draft rolls And even, even in that uh, fourth, fifth-round range, there's a bunch of guys oh, that yeah. had some really good careers. And, again, yeah. you know, when you go through as deep of the draft, at least that I'm going into with these guys trying to find out a little bit about everybody all the way through seven rounds, Tom and Jim, is that uh, because of the number of games played, a lot of these guys played a quarter of a season or no season or – you know, yeah. coming off an injured season, they only played five games. It's very difficult because you you don't have the sample size that you used yeah. to. So it, yeah, it, it would at, scare well, me as a as a personnel man to, you know, go in there and and and, and jump on a table for some of these guys even in the later rounds. Well, it's t- I mean, I was going through some of the Big Ten receivers today. You know, Bateman, Rashad Bateman is, you know, he's going up the draft board. Rondell Moore is going up the draft board. You know, y- at least those guys played. And then you compare him, and he's a different player. But look at Nico Collins, who's t- typically he's going to be probably an X receiver in the NFL. He's a six four wide receiver out of out of Michigan. He's different than those guys, but he opted out. Like you said, I, I think teams, much to your point, Jeff, they're going to want the more known commodity. So even if their games were limited, uh, like those previous players that I mentioned, whether at Purdue or Minnesota or and the players that least were able to participate in, in the Senior Bowl, you're probably going to want to select, just to be on the safe side, the, the more known commodity is, is probably the best way to say it. All right, let's take a break. Before we join Roquan Smith at the bottom of the hour, this is Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score with Tom there, Jim Miller. I'm Jeff Joniak. Back in a few. Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score with our producer, Julio Rosale, who, by the way, Tom and Jim was the play-by-play man, he tells me, of the Chicago Slaughter. So he, too, uh, moved by the news on uh, Steve McMichael today. Uh, That's a pretty cool story. Steve uh, was great to everybody. That's for sure, whoever he ran into. If you get past the mean look on his face and maybe some salty language. Right, guys? (laughs) Oh, gosh, Lee. You you know, the the one thing about Steve is – is I and I tell a story a lot of times because Ming was super encouraging in the weight room in like the exterior things that you had to be good at in order to be a professional football player and he was he was complimentary he was encouraging he made you feel good but then he also brought it out onto the football field when you needed it most so you know he was a he was a ever present guy from the weight room to the meeting room to on the field, and he did it. That's where his influence is the biggest. Yeah, sad to hear that that news today. I know you guys touched on it uh, earlier, and I've had cross paths with uh, McMichael a few times in my time in Chicago. Nothing but uh, total respect, and we just had great exchanges back and forth. A very intelligent uh, man, and everything that he was involved with, and uh, you know, so thoughts and prayers out to his family. But I think you get the genuine sense, and I heard. Tom talking earlier uh, about his teammate, you know, and, and it's sad where you get to this point in life. I've lost some teammates like Ryan Wetnight, who was a, a hmm. former Chicago Bear, and I, I think it all hurts. There's no doubt about that. But you can generally, generally see the true love of your fellow teammates and obviously the the reaching out from Tom and 
all of his teammates a truly special group, a very tight knit group, and I think that that really shows and really has been exemplified. Uh, since the news broke uh, earlier and what I heard about it today. I think that's just a byproduct uh, of those locker rooms. I don't care what year, what team. If it was a tight locker room, those guys are going to be together for a long time. Jim, your team, 01, and, and your other teams in, in the course of your career, uh, you could feel it. You could feel it from the 06 team here uh, and, and that group of guys. And, Tom, certainly your your 85 team, uh, that goes without saying. They've, they've uh, despite despite all of what it was, Offense, defense, it's still – you come together in times of need. So that's for sure. Uh, coming up here in moments, we're going to be joined by Roquan Smith, the Bears Ed Block Courage Award winner of the event tomorrow night, national event, the uh, Award Foundation at 6 o'clock, uh, virtually everything virtually, obviously, right now. Hey, real quick, before we join Roquan, that uh, before last week's show, we didn't we didn't have the official word, but Deshaun Gibson back with the Bears. Uh, Jim at safety, uh, that, that – relationship you know so there are some executives that feel safeties i hate to use this term but they you know oh i you can find them anywhere in the draft and you you can run through them and certainly we have had many safeties here in chicago over the years uh lovey smith's uh, era they they kept drafting guys and playing them and drafted them and sometimes they get a lot of playing time and then they, they'd be gone but there's been a rotation with eddie jackson does he benefit from having the same guy back there uh, there's going to be likely competition, but assuming this is a starting role again uh, for Tashawn, is that an important choreographed aspect of the secondary? Yeah, I, I like the resigning to Tashawn. I thought he displayed uh, a lot of leadership last year. I think you certainly could see his energy and enthusiasm. He plays with a, a lot of heart. Thought he was very productive. 65 tackles, had seven pass defense, two uh, interceptions. Has a love for the game and. You know, I, I just I like the resigning. I really thought he played well uh, in the back end of, the, of that secondary. And well, you know, we'll see Eddie Jackson. I thought Eddie had a down year. We'll see if he's motivated to come back, bounce back, and have a bounce back year from that standpoint. But yeah, I think that continuity always helps. And we'll see if he's able to hold and solidify that that spot again because I do think there'll be competition there at the safety spot. Yeah, I'm happy too. It completely changes all of my mock drafts. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was considering the Bears taking the safety. However, you know, I think that the safety has really become a difficult position in the NFL. I think when you talk about, oh, you know, running backs are a dime a dozen, or you can get a guard anywhere to come in and play, or centers aren't that valuable. To me, I think safeties has increased in value over the last 10 years in the NFL because of the difficulty of the offenses they're facing. It's not a predetermined run offense on first down, and then we'll see how many yards we get, and maybe we'll run it again or we'll throw it for the first time. you got to be ready to be challenged on any down and distance if you're a defensive back, if you have any coverage responsibility. So I'm really happy that Deshaun Gibson is back with the Bears, and um, I think it also can change where they can go in the draft because there isn't such a vulnerability in the center of that defense without him here. Well, after our interview with uh, Roquan coming up here in moments, I, I asked my partners here to uh, pick 20, 52, and 83 to come up with the right scheme fits for the Bears, what we think they're going to run at whatever position they deem appropriate. So you guys still have some time to think that through. We're going to wait till uh, after Roquan. I got some ideas, too. You know I always fall in love with guys. Last year, my guy was Antoine Winfield. Guy wins a Super Bowl back there with his boy Tom Brady. <laughs> I love well, that player. But it's... I got I got another one. I got another one this year after weeks of research. I'm, I just I can't get him out of my head. But I'll tell you about him later. You guys laugh at that all the time. What? It's you know, usually the smallest guy in the field. Well, yeah, I mean, I know the more the kid from uh, Purdue that you fell in love with because he had like a 60-inch vertical jump. I backed off you know, a little bit. But, uh, Are you talking about okay. Rondell? Yeah. Yes. Jim, overall, your favorite player in the draft, regardless of position and round. Got one? I, well, guy you just can't get out of your head. Well, the guy. The, Bears or nobody. I don't care who. Who is it? Well, we brought him up, and, and kind of Jim Nagy put me on his radar screen down at the, the Senior Bowl. That Richie Grant. And it, mm -hmm. it's a safety position. That guy's a heck of a player. You know, I, th I think it's going to be interesting to see which guy goes first when you look at Trayvon uh, Marig or Richie Grant. But Richie Grant's just a fun player to watch, how he practices. He's just, you know, he's kind of an old-school player, but he's versatile. He does it all and extremely productive. And there's, there's a lot of favorite players in this draft. There's some good players. And we'll see what diamonds in the rough the, the Bears can uncover. Tom? 
Do you got one? You know, it's got to be an old lineman. You know, Give me an old lineman. No, well, I was it. Is it Cosme? Is that yes, how you Sam say Cosme. it? The offensive yep, tackle yep. from Texas. You know, thirty-four starts, six, seven, three, ten. He's been there, man. He's had his hand in. In you know, he's got a lot of starts. He's got a lot of confidence. He's got a lot of experience. So it's not a big transition asking him to come in and play immediately because that's what he's used to. And I think when you're a guy, you know, Jim, you know that of, of when you're dedicated and you want to be a starter every down you play a football from Pop Warner to the end of your career, he just seems like one of those guys that that wants to be on the field. And, you know, kind of similar what we've learned about Jermaine Effetti. I know he's had his ups and downs and he's had some issues throughout at this time, but man, he shows up every Sunday. He's in, he's in his uniform and he's playing football. So when I think about the Bears and the need for an offensive tackle, I look at this guy and 34 starts in college. He's got a lot. He's got a long track record of success, and he's gotten better every year. He's improved, and it's just like uh, Kellen Mond, the quarterback from A&M. He's a four-year starter. His his um, stats have improved every year. He's on the field. He's he's gotten to be a better football player. That's going to be able to transfer to the NFL level. So, uh, but you know that I, I think his name is Pity, the the defensive end, the pass rusher Quiddy, from Quiddy Michigan. Pay. Yeah, Quiddy Pay. Yeah, yeah. So I, when I look at his frame, I look at his body. He reminds me of a, he's got a built like a Khalil. And when I think of the two high po- high profile pass rushers at Miami, I'm not as excited about those guys as maybe where they're they're falling into the draft right now. I like the framework of some of these pass rushers that earn leverage throughout their rush. They don't have to falsely bend their knees all right time to switch gears and get on board with our friend roquan smith the 2020 bears representation for the ed block courage award is voted on by teammates kind enough to spend some time with us here on chicago sports radio 670 the score roquan you're with tom thayer jim miller and yours truly jeff joniak good to talk to you congratulations on the honor i know every time a player gets this award and uh it means a heck of a lot because it's your brethren in the locker room that say, hey, you know, this is the guy that's uh, that's really earned this right to, to represent the Bears in this fashion. And, and I'm certain that's that's how you feel about it, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a tremendous honor for me. Uh, it's good to be on here as well. Thank you guys for having me. But, yes, yeah, a tremendous honor to be voted on by my teammates. It means a lot to me. And, man, yeah, it's big time. Now, obviously, a lot of this has to do usually with somebody overcoming something significant, whether it be physical or off the field or something like that. But there is an emphasis on sportsmanship and, and the courage to uh, to lead and be an inspiration in the locker room. So that that's on your that's on your resume right now. And you know, you came into this sport uh, at Georgia and emerging as a leader of that program and. You're you're leaning in that direction now with the Bears as well. Do you feel that now as you enter year four? I absolutely. I feel it like even going into last year, uh, I was a bit more comfortable and felt like it was going to be a really good year. And then with this year here coming, with year four, I feel like year three, in my opinion, was an appetizer to what I like have on my radar for this year. So, so a lot more comfortable, and I'm very excited to get get back going. Roquan, congratulations. We're super happy for you, and we're glad you're a Chicago Bear. I don't know if you had any defensive coaching changes throughout your college career, but in your short time here in the NFL, you're on your third defensive coordinator. What is that uh, transfer like from going from one voice in the room to the next to the next? Uh, it's, a, it's an adjustment for sure because everyone's philosophy uh, is a little is a little different in what they believe in. But at the end of the day, I just look at it as a – as if ball is ball and there's only so many things you can call and only so many things you can run and it's just about when you run them and I feel like that's the that's what the difference in like each and every defensive coordinator so I'm like I'm excited for uh with coach Desai and uh, I think it's going to be great and yeah I'm looking forward to it Roquan Jim Miller again good to talk to you I hope you're having a a great off season and let me just ask this, what areas of focus for you? I know from your standpoint, I thought you had an all-pro year last year and just how you performed, but, you know, areas where you want to get better here this offseason. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's always room for improvement, and uh, 
I'm, I'm looking at a lot of a lot of different things. I'm, uh, I want to even get better at my uh, my pass coverage. I want to get better at my uh, block protection. That's definitely a thing that I want to uh, emphasize. Uh, not saying that I'm like horrible or anything like that, but I just want to improve at a, a lot of those things and different things in the run game as well. So I feel like there's a lot of things I can do to my overall game to help me improve and not just like one one thing in particular. Roquan, how do you feel about the 17 games? Hey, it is what it is. Uh, 17 <laughs> games. Good for you. I'll be ready. I'll be ready for each and every one. That's what I like to hear as well. Roquan Smith, our yes. guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. Uh, I, I always find it interesting come draft time, Roquan, because you start reading all the different profiles on guys watching tape, and everybody keeps saying how the game's changing and, you know, the prototypical linebacker size has changed over the years, even in the 3-4. Uh, bigger backers, when you think of the Steelers, 3-4. Now those guys are kind of getting phased out to the smaller guys to, to keep up with the, the different nickel packages offensively. And, and you know, they're even getting smaller than, than, than you are now. I mean, when you came into the league, they, they, the faster the guys that almost can play safety. Do you feel that change? And if you don't, how critical right now, beyond your athleticism, are your eyes as a defensive player in the current way teams are running offenses? Oh, your eyes are everything. And, like, the way they're running, uh, the way offenses are attacking guys now, and they're more so just attacking guys with eyes, and it's just testing your eye discipline. So that's a big thing. And if I was an offensive coordinator, I would try the same thing, do the same thing. But – I think it's it's big that, like, so many guys, linebackers, you look at linebackers from, you know, in the 90s, early 2000s, how they was 250, 260-pound backers. Like, yeah, it's not really that place that place anymore, man, because it's, like, it's run and hit. And then they're just forcing a lot of linebackers in the coverage situation. So the better you can be at covering and uh, running and hitting, I think that's the longer you'll last in this league because that's definitely where the league is going. And it's just about – who's going to make those uh, adjustments, in my opinion. Where will you be watching the draft? Do you participate in the draft and pay attention to all the picks that, that fall off the board as you were just in that situation a couple of seasons ago? Uh, yeah, I absolutely. I absolutely pay attention to a lot of guys from Georgia and stuff. I like to keep up with those guys, seeing what they're up to as well, the guys from Georgia. And then also just seeing my new teammates, seeing who we get, uh, excited to welcome those guys in. So I'll be looking forward to that. Hey, Roquan, when you talk about improving your eyes and you talk about all the responsibilities you have, when you talk about improving your pass coverage responsibility, is that a conditioning thing or is that having better knowledge of the offenses that you're seeing in front of you depending game by game? I definitely think it's uh, something to do with uh, the offenses that are in, in front of you and, like, what you're saying in your route route recognition. That uh, helps you out a lot because if you know what a guy can do, you can let him run his route, whatever, and you'll just be sitting there waiting on him. So I think that's big. And also I think it's just about actually focusing on yourself and staying true to your technique when you don't know what the uh, route may be because you're not going to know the route every single play. So it's about just sticking true to your technique and uh, – that keep glued in on your uh, guy that you're covering. Roquan Smith, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. Score one more round of questions with the three of us. Roquan, we'll let you go. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, exactly what is your impression of what uh, Sean Desai has up his sleeve? Because you know he's been here a while. You've worked with him uh, indirectly over the years here as a Chicago Bear and entering your fourth season. Uh, it sounds like he wants it to be a pretty aggressive uh, attacking defense. Okay. Might have lost Roquan there. Okay, we lost Roquan there on our phone call, so uh, we'll probably uh, not be able to get him back at this point in the show. But uh, very insightful stuff uh, from Roquan Smith. And, and, fellas, he talks about those Georgia guys, uh, Aziz Ojalare, Monty Rice, Eric Stokes, Tyson Campbell. That That's just the, the defensive guys. Jim, there's so many Georgia guys out of that uh, great program right now. <laughs> So his uh, guys that he came in with, probably, uh, those guys came in with him. And uh, he is. He's very intrigued by some of that. The Bears have drafted several Georgia guys, obviously, and may very well do it again. While we have a chance, let's take a break. We come back. Jim and Tom give us their best possible fits for picks 20, 52, and 83. Should the Bears stay there Thursday 
and Friday of the NFL Draft. This is Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer, and Jim Miller with you. Roquan offers his apology. Had a bad, uh, bad line that dropped out. So we'll let him enjoy his weekend. Good to talk to him, though. Sounds very fired up, fellas. Uh, again, uh, another important season, an impactful season. Hopefully he could stay healthy after suffering that injury in the Packer game, missed the playoff game, but a very big part of the Bears' defensive future. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an appointment in clinic or virtually and start feeling better tomorrow. Okay, pick 20, round one, Thursday night. Should they stay there? Start with Jim Miller who might be the best fit no matter a position for the Chicago Bears, in your opinion? I think those corners are off the board. I don't think those uh, quarterbacks are going to fall through unless the Bears trade up uh, to, to get a couple of spots. You know how I feel about J.C. Horn. That's a press man corner uh, down in South Carolina. Love him, but I think that's where some tackles start to come off the board. If Darasaw is gone out of Virginia Tech, I think then you start to turn to the guys we just talked about. Tevin Jenkins out of Oklahoma State. You look at him, 6'5", 317. Uh, he's got... Uh, 33 and a half inch arms, 810. He can move as well, but I think you're looking at a strong starting uh, right tackle right there. I think Tom made a good call on Sam Cosme. Uh, if tackles do start to run uh, and the Bears have a shot at him, his numbers are incredible. Six foot six out of Texas, 314 pounds, ran a 487 at that size. Everybody thinks he's a can't miss player. So he's got strong hands, tremendous, tremendous work ethic. Uh, an offensive line coach of 30 years said uh, he's got an athleticism and the determination, and he loves him from, the, from that standpoint. So if the corner's not there, I will definitely take one of those offensive tackles that I just mentioned. Well, and Tom Herman's on the Bears staff, so he knows very well what they're dealing with with these players. Tom, who's tw- who at 20 for you? I, I Like I said, I'm going with the big offensive tackle from Texas. Again, I like the fact that he's got 34 starts. Jim talked about all of his measurables. He's proved that he is uh, he's in it to win it. He's in it for a lifetime, and um, that's what I want. I don't want to have to feed the sport to a guy. I want him to already be at the buffet table. <laughs> I like that line. I, I am uh, intrigued by Tevin Jenkins for, for what it's worth for me. If uh, if that's the route they're going to go with tackle, I, the quote that I just can't stop thinking about that he just uh, keeps talking about is, uh, quote, I'm, I'm going to be one of those guys who, who will finish people in the dirt. And uh, that's the kind of mentality I want in my offensive lineman, certainly on the, the outside there. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go Hold ahead. On. Be careful what the player says about themselves. If you recall, when we drafted that offensive tackle in the first round from Wisconsin, before the draft, he said that he is the best offensive right. tackle in the draft. We talking about we Gabe Creamy? For it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. well, so, you know, you hear, you hear I don't, a lot don't of fall for the Don't fall for the self-promotion. <laughs> fall, fall for what they've proved on tape. All right, I got you. And uh, in terms of pick number 52, Jim Miller. Well, Second they, round. Yeah, so if they're unable to get the corner first round, let's say they elect to tackle, or say if they do get a corner first round, then you still have tackles left that in the second round. I mentioned Jalen Mayfield, a uh, potential out of Michigan, could be a, a guy targeted. Plus there's other tackles that are going to be there as well. But for me, it's kind of those two corners that, that you mentioned out of Georgia. Both come in over uh, six foot when you look at Tyson Campbell and Eric Stokes. All right, Ran a blazing. Uh, Stokes ran a four. Uh, what do I have, Matt? Uh, four two nine was his uh, forty yard dash. Tyson Campbell, he's kind of rising up the board as well. He ran a four three six. I actually think uh, Tyson will be gone at that point, but Stokes uh, could still be there. But numerous Campbells are going to be there. Kelvin Joseph of Kentucky will be there. I would think Aaron Robinson from UCF would also uh, be there. That would fit the bill. These are bigger corners that that can run. But I'm thinking trying to target one of those one of those corners out of Georgia that are two press man corners. Tom, uh, you know, will Bateman still be around in the second round, or is he gone for sure? I need size at the receiver position. I love Darnell Mooney. There's so much uncertainty about Javon Wims and Anthony Miller that I I don't know what 
where to consider them. I love Allen Robinson, but I need some size at receiver. And, he, he, you know, Jim brought up Collins from Michigan. There's a 6'4 guy. And what I like about Collins is he played for a coach that has a really tough guy attitude. And sometimes you bring that to the next level. You were raised by Jim Harbaugh in the college ranks, and if I if you can give me – uh, a significantly sized receiver, and then when you think about Jimmy Graham and Cole Komet, you're talking about pretty big receivers to help the quarterback position. Yeah, the slot position is something I'm looking at too. I, I would consider uh, if he does not let it get in the first round, maybe it's too late for a guy like Elijah Moore. Uh, there's a lot of speed. There are size receivers. There's a whole buffet, as uh, Jim has mentioned. Now, just throwing this out of the table because of the back injury, and I know we're probably running long on you, Jim, but um, if for some reason Caleb Farley is there at 20 and then you go to, say, Dylan Raddins, the uh, offensive lineman from North Dakota State in round two, would that be a scenario that could work for the Bears? Yeah, there's no doubt. I think that's just the medical competitive I- advantage. You know, supposedly his, his uh, recheck uh, at Indianapolis went well. I guess there was nothing here. But, again, team's personal doctors are going to have to look at it and make that decision. You know, I, I think the Bears have, you know, made their share of mistakes. I think self-admittedly when they've, you know, basically selected a player that coming off an injury and it didn't work well. So that's all going to be from the medical and the doctors in order to make that decision. But I will say this about that Virginia Tech corner, that dude can absolutely run. He can flat out run all over the field. So we'll we'll see. I think people got him falling due to that that medical, but we'll see who's willing to take uh, the chance on him. All right. So here here's my guy, my little guy for the year. Uh, it's Elijah Molden out of Washington. I really love this guy's play. Now he's pure slot, but you know he's got some feistiness at five nine and a half, one ninety two. There's a lot to like about this guy. We don't have enough time to break him down, but I'm just throwing out a thought there at the table. Now, we can't go through a buffet of players here at 83 because of time. So, Jim, you got to give me one player third round. Who's it going to be? Going quarterback. I, think I knew you would. There's going to be three guys there. I you got to tr- give me one. Trask is probably too heavy-footed, <laughs> so I will go with Davis Mills. I love okay. how he throws the football, and he's athletic enough to do all the things the Bears are looking for. That dude can sling it. Dom? Cam Bynum, quarterback, cornerback, Cal, 6'1", 200 pounds. Ryan Pace did a nice job of picking Jalen Johnson in the second round, got play out of him. I'm going to see if he can do it in the third round. So you're going quarterback free for the first three rounds. Cor- quarterback, quarterback, quarterback free. Corner. I know, I'm saying you're C-O-R-N-E. going. I said okay. you're going quarterback oh, yes. free. Yeah, uh, the Tom Stanford. just wants to add another Golden Domer. He'll go even block <laughs> the next round. Oh. <laughs> Then he wants Jeremiah Wosu Koromawa. Or Koromawa. That guy's something else. Now, that's a chess piece. Can they afford something like that? I I think they'd have to trade up to get him. I really do. He's such a versatile player. Hey, looking forward to this draft. I think it's all over the map. There's so many guys that you kind of say, man, he looked good in a Bears uniform, and uh, you hope that would be the case. But who knows how it's going to work. I think there's going to be a lot of trades. I know you'll be breaking it down on Sirius XM NFL Radio. And we'll, um, we're not going to have a show next week for the draft, so we'll be reviewing the draft the following week, Jim. And so have a great uh, great week next week. I know it's right in your wheelhouse. You guys do a ton of work. Enjoy it. It's going to be fun. A lot of, And I know you guys will be all over it as well, seeing who the Bears select. So, yeah, let's all enjoy it. It's going to be great. Exactly. We'll be on WBBM on Thursday night. And then Friday, Saturday, uh, the score will have a ton of draft coverage as well. We're going to take a break. Tom Thayer returns with me in a moment on Chicago Sports Radio 670, the score. Predict who and where the Bears will play each week this season, and you could win $25,000. Enter the sh- uh, schedule prediction challenge brought to you by United Airlines at ChicagoBears.com. Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer wrapping things up. A couple of minutes before we hand it off to Anthony Heron. Here on Chicago Sports Radio 670, the score. He'll be talking NFL as well as a big, another big uh, explosion of runs by the Cubs today as they wipe out uh, their opponents with a 15-run, 17-hit attack today. So 38 runs in their four-game winning streak. All right, Tom, so we always talk about what everybody needs. What don't the Bears need? In this draft, hey, high high in the draft, I don't want a tight end. I you know so at last year at the first nine games, um, 
Jimmy Graham played 636 snaps in the first nine weeks. In the next nine weeks, Cole played more than him at 603 snaps. So I like how they complement each other, and they have a couple of other tight ends that are very playable. So if you find a guy in the free agent market or down the road, yeah, take you know take a chance on him if, depending upon what type of look he has. And, and I would go interior offensive line because there, it's a it's a logjam. There's a, there's a lot of guys there that can play, start. The competition's going to be good. I would say if you're going to go on the offensive line, I would like I would prefer anyway that you get another tackle into the mix. Uh, but you know it's funny because if you got a guy like the USC kid Elijah Vera, uh, Vera uh, if he right. you know could he play tackle? Looks like he can, but maybe he is a, a guard at a Pro Bowl level. I mean, that that's the way the think, thinking process is. But do you pass on somebody like that? No, you don't. If if that's somebody you have highly graded, so you go best player available. I really don't think that's cliche, and I think that's that's something the Bears are going to have to look at. Everything else on the table for this Bears team in 2021. Looking forward to it, Tom. Good job. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Draft coverage all week long on WBBM and 670 The Score. Thanks to our crew, including Jim Miller for Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks to Jordan Treadup, Dan Brilli, Julio Rosseo, Anthony Heron next on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening to this Chicago Bears Network presentation of Bears All Access. Podcasts are available on chicagobears.com and on iTunes or download the official Bears mobile app. Bears All Access has been brought to you by IGS Energy and sponsored by Miller Lite.